Uh, welcome to the FAU Libraries webinar, The Literature Review, A Roadmap for Finding and Organizing Information. My name is Christy Padrone. I'm the Scholarly Communication Services Librarian, and my main task is to help the students, faculty, and staff of FAU use the library and find the information that they need. If you have any questions, you can ask in the chat. We will, at different times of the webinar, uh, go to your questions. Uh, so you don't have to have your audio or your camera on. That seems to go kind of smoothly that way. Now, for those of you who are doing this for the certificate of completion, at the end of the webinar, I will be giving a URL and a QR code so that you can go to the Google form to take a 10 item quiz based on the content that's been covered here. Don't worry, you can take it more than once. Um, and, and also, once you're finished with it, if you answer eight out of the 10 items correctly, you will get your certificate emailed to you right, right away. All right, so are there any questions before we begin? Okay, so someone asked if we can get the recording if we can't stay for the whole thing. This will be record this will be posted on the FAU Libraries YouTube page. So I should have this up by tomorrow. So the full recording of this will be up so you could see that. And then um, the URL. Um, yes, I will get I'll put the URL to the quiz up um, once we get to that part of the of the uh, webinar. So all right, so with that, I will get started. Okay, so today's objective will be to define the literature within broader disciplines. I see that we have a nice array of majors and disciplines here, ranging from business, studio art, to chemistry, so welcome everyone. I think that the content today will be able to address the literature review for your particular area. We will also describe the purpose of literature reviews. Um, it's kind of like a, a dive and an inquiry into your subject area. Your advisor and your professor will advise you on your research question, hypothesis, or topic, but this will help you kind of like get a map of how to start the search itself. Um, and the session does focus on the search, not necessarily on the writing of your literature review. And finally, today's webinar will illustrate the steps of a literature review. So what is a literature? So before you started, the university, you probably read a lot of books, magazines, and newspapers. We've all watched videos and, of course, interviews. But then as you continued coming back to school and started reading more of the professional and scholarly literature, you probably got to see more journals, conference proceedings. Maybe you were asked to read a dissertation or theses. P.S. If you want to score bonus points with your professor advisor, read their thesis or dissertation. We do have um, that available through the libraries. But then some disciplines may have more specialized forms of publications, like maybe patents, trade reports, or standards and guidelines. There's specialized ones like data sets, archives, which are collections of older uh, publications or documents, but were preserved for their uniqueness and value. And then for some of you, maybe you had to look in government documents, that is things published by the US state or local governments, or even go into the laws and statutes. So the literature is literally like a world of published information and then of course, there's a gray literature, which is kind of like publications that don't really fall into the previously known categories. So what is the literature? In a scholarly, academic, or professional sense, it is a body of work that has been distributed, written, or published on a given topic or concept. So we do know literature as creative works like fiction and nonfiction or poetry, but in the a, the college world, it's considered to be like a body of published work and even unpublished work too. The literature review, as you can see from the previous types of uh, publications we saw on the slide, they can be multiple formats and it really depends on the academic subject or discipline. Now the science and empirical based subjects they really look at journal articles to communicate their findings and trade reports, whereas people in the creative arts may look at paintings, visual works, or criticism and interpretative works as their form of literature. 
Now the literature does have various intents. Most importantly, it's to inform what's going on. What's, what do we know right now about a certain person, place or thing? But it's also used, especially in an academic setting to support your points or to persuade uh, which way is a better way to approach or look at a problem or scenario. But the literature and other publications also help update with new knowledge and information that's been published and even dispute. So you'll get a lot of information sources where study A says this is a good thing, but study B says no, it's not, this way is better. So the literature review also exposes us to many different points of view and also ways to study a particular issue. Now, the literature consists of the following. You got the major works, which are known as seminal publications or really important renowned papers or publications on a particular concept. Then you got other works or publications that build upon or respond to the major works. So you have one person that has a really good idea and other people like it and they take it Okay, they don't take it and copy it necessarily, but they try to research or understand or study it in a certain or a new way. I use this banyan tree, like the kind you see around the Boca Raton campus as an example. You got like this main trunk in the middle of this tree that's like the biggest part of the tree. And then you have all these little offshoots, branches going you know, towards the sky and even toward the ground. And I like to think of the literature review as kind of like a banyan tree. It's a continuously evolving network of scholarly works that interact with each other. The literature review can kind of be seen the same way too. Now the literature generally falls into one of three categories. So first you've got primary sources. These are defined as direct firsthand accounts of practices, events, or conditions being researched. Primary sources also include creative works or artifacts. So primary source usually has to do with a work or a publication where whoever created it was actually working with it or studying it or um, creating it directly. Then you've got secondary sources, which are sources that discuss, study, or comment on information from primary sources. So it's kind of like an indirect interaction with whatever it is they're studying or examining. And these can include reviews or critiques. So it's not necessarily somebody's work that's the focus, but somebody's interpretation or discussion of one. And then you have tertiary sources that utilize and distill information from primary and secondary sources. And these usually are in the forms of guides and encyclopedias. Now, the types of works and the types of sources, including in a literature review, will depend on the objectives and needs for your particular review. I understand that for some, scholar, some assignments, your professor may ask you to focus on primary sources and may not allow you to look at references or encyclopedias or anything like that. But when you're into your thesis or doing something where um, you're gonna look at a lot of types of information, you may need to draw on these three different sources for different types, you know, for different information and for different reasons. Now to go into some examples of how these may look, if you're in the sciences or health sciences, these are gonna be your primary sources original research in the form of journal articles or research reports or prepense will be your primary source. These were written by someone who actually did the research and now they're publishing it and telling the world about it. And the same goes for conference papers and posters with a research focus. Theses and dissertations are a form of a primary source, which is the same for the humanities too. And then for you all, patents and inventions are a form of a primary source, along with technical reports, lab notebooks, and raw data. Now, for people in the humanities, creative works are going to be the primary source. And as I'd mentioned earlier, it's going to be the original literature, fiction, nonfiction, poetry, film, and performances. Uh, music scores will be another example, statutes and laws. And then you may go into more specialized sources like um, diaries, autobiographies, regalia and original artifacts are also considered a primary source like a painting. 
magazine and newspaper articles are considered primary sources because they're written by somebody who's writing about something. And I'll go into a moment about the difference between criticism and interpretation in a moment. Sacred texts are also considered a primary source. I worked with somebody that did a lot of work with that and she was talking to me about that. And then official documents like birth certificates or titles or deeds may be considered a primary source along with oral history, field notes and raw data. Now for the business person or people should I say, and those of you who may be in the social science, I find that those disciplines tend to use a combination from those broad disciplines. So um, I know a social worker who did a lot of work with interviews, but she also took a look at a lot of primary research done in social work and with her particular population of people she worked with. So that's an example of where they used both uh, humanities primary sources and the sciences. Now we go into the secondary sources. Literature reviews are considered a type of secondary source. So you're not really doing the research per se, like the hard science, like, like um, empirical research or qualitative research or anything like that. You're just taking the research of other people and making it into a new document. A data analysis may be considered a secondary source along with a systematic review or a meta-analysis. Articles in trade journals or Articles that aren't so much based on research or they summarize research are considered a secondary source. So are opinion pieces, commentaries, and letters to the editor. And textbooks and books are tend, tend to be considered secondary sources in the sciences. They usually communicate their research through the literature, like journal articles and not so much books. For the humanities, Journal articles where they critique or interpret a work tend to be secondary sources. Now somebody's writing about it, but they're not, they didn't actually do the creation or whatever it is that they're um, trying to write about. Monographs or books written about a topic tend to be considered secondary sources. Biographies are a secondary source um, because the author is writing about somebody, which is an indirect interaction with what they're doing. Music scores that have been changed is considered a secondary source, and so are biographies and law reviews. Then the tertiary sources. We probably remember these from when we were a little younger, like the World Almanac, the Guinness Book of World Records, the things that give us little quick facts, quick figures, fun facts sometimes even. And these would be the form of handbooks like the DSM, um, the di um, gosh, the acronym slips my mind, but the mental health field uses that a lot. Standards are considered a tertiary source. Um, almanacs, encyclopedias, and manuals. So these are, like I said, the books of facts and little pieces of information that we may need to know and cite occasionally. All right, so what is a literature review? It's defined as an iterative process of identifying, locating, examining, and synthesizing scholarly information and publications on a particular topic. So you're gonna go find what's out there, examine it, and then once you feel you found a critical mass of information, you're then gonna synthesize it into your document. It's one of the first things done by any student or scholar who plans to pursue new knowledge or research in most subject areas. Now, I know that for some of you in the sciences who spend a lot of time in the lab, I know that there's a lot of emphasis on the lab work and finding new discoveries that way. But a literature review kind of goes hand in hand with lab work because the literature review helps you know what is known about your, what it is you're studying before you pursue it. The literature review provides background and context on current knowledge of a topic, and it also establishes the base upon which any new work stands. So it's kind of like I said, you know, you got to know what's out there before you could really consider yourself an expert and write more and add to what's known about it. Now, a literature review can be very simple, like you're just asked to find 10 journal articles on your topic. It could be a quick review or a survey. Or it could be really complex, like you're doing it to uncover a research topic so you can study it further. 
or maybe it's something very refined and very, very narrow in terms of its focus and scope. So the literature review can come in many shapes, sizes, and colors, so to speak. But ultimately, the literature review lays out a logical case to defend points or conclusions asserted in your thesis or other document that you may have. It's really considered an exercise in applied critical thinking. Now, a literature review develops an understanding of a topic on four different directions. First, you're going to take a look at the research theory and the philosophy of your concept. You're going to help, it's going to help you establish your con intellectual concept and help you go towards defining your concept for your thesis or your assignment. You get the history of its development. You're going to gain the background, like where it began to its present history. It's kind of like you need to know the you know, you need, you need to know your past to move ahead or to create a future, so to speak. It's not that different with, with most forms of your scholarly knowledge. A literature review will help you identify the latest research and developments in your topic. You can identify the current thinking, uh, what are some issues related to it, what are some arguments. And here's where you could really take a look at what's not published or known, known as a knowledge gap. Just to give you an example, when I was an undergraduate in the 1990s, I was a psychology major. I had a summer research program and I was doing a, um, a research on a mental health concept. Well, one of the things I was noticed was there was a real lack of research on people of color and mental health. Um, it was also during that time where they also noticed a lot of the heart research was done mostly on men, not to Raz, you guys, males here, not at all, but just that, um, you know, women and men have different physiology, uh, and they didn't really know much about heart problems with women, so there was definitely more needed to be done so that, well, they can treat women for heart problems better. Then the literature review will help with research methods and constructs. You'll see how they approach doing the research. You'll see the techniques. Uh, the paradigms and other ways that they studied a particular concept. So when you put all this together, this is really here to help a student or researcher establish their credibility. So the literature review is your way of saying, this is what I know about my concept so far. This is what we know. And this also helps you establish your research as being meaningful. And what you find will lead to a synthesis that provides a critical analysis of your selected literature. Now the literature review goes beyond being a summary. It's not an annotated bibliography, although it could start out that way, and it's not a laundry list of articles. It's really not a linear process. Now I've done a lot of literature reviews where I found something new and I had to start again because my initial, um, my initial idea was all wrong. I learned more about it. Oh, wait, I'm not doing this the right way. I better do something differently. So I had to go back. So early steps may need to be revisited because of new or additional information found. And then going back to the people who just want to do the research, collect the data, um, work in the lab, it's really not an optional step when exploring research or exploring a topic. So definitely think about this as an opportunity to really get to know um, something you're interested in and how it contributes to your particular discipline. You'll be often asked to do a literature review for assignments and then of course your thesis and dissertation. It could be your background for original research. For those of you who are more into the humanities, a literature review can really help with your criticism and interpretation for a particular concept. And even for those of you who are, in, are more the creative part, you do painting, you do sculpture, a literature review will really help you see what's out there and how your particular medium has been worked with over the years. As you... Uh, and you will finish someday, you will someday have that MA, PhD, or your bachelor's degree, and you may find yourself applying for grants. And grant proposals may ask you to give a little literature review or summary to back up your application for funds. 
And then for those of you who do evidence-based practice, whether you're in health, medicine, or, so, or even education, a literature review is also very essential for when you're doing that kind of research. I see that I had a question here and they asked if we can get a copy of the slides. Uh, yes, I can do that. I do have um, an email. I do have all of your emails and what I could do is send these slides to you um, at the end and then you could get all these and use them as you need. So thanks for asking about that, Carol. Then we have some differences among the literature, different types of review. The purpose and scope will be different. Like I said, it could be a, a little exploration or it could be a very deep dive. It could be a very rigorous literature review or not so rigorous, depending on how you select and appraise what you find. Some disciplines have standards like PRISMA is used in the healthcare field and they use a lot of pre-established criteria, which I will describe in just a moment. Discipline norms will also dictate how a literature review is done. I will admit that I'm not quite as familiar with the things in the visual arts as I am for the sciences and social sciences, but I imagine what they would do, like what kind of literature they would do for studio art would be a lot different for someone in a different field. And then of course, literature reviews can be organized differently, like by subject or theme known as topical or narrative or chronological, Okay, you begin at the beginning of your concept and then you kind of go towards the present day and then also geographical. So for instance, if you're covering a concept that's discussed in many different countries or something like that, you may see, okay, how's Europe discussing this concept? How's Asia discussing this concept? How's North America discussing this and so forth? Okay, sorry, I, my screen's a little funny here, but, but these are the main differences among the different types of literature reviews. There's six different or six common types of reviews that are out there. Now the scoping review I'd probably say is like the quick dive. You just kind of see what's out there on your topic. State of the art or science is a literature review where you look at what do we know now, what's out there right now about a particular topic. The narrative review is just kind of like a general view, not too deep, not too shallow either. A critical review like kind of like analyzes, interprets, and really takes a look at what's out there with a the fine tuned comb. A systematic review is a type of literature review that only includes certain types of studies. So somebody will have a pre-established criteria where they say, okay, Things have to be published within a certain time span. They have to have a certain study design. They have to take certain statistics or certain people or population must be focused and so forth. So a systematic review, I like to call it members of the club, <laughs> kind of like um, when, they, when they include what publications to include. And meta-analysis is like a literature review that not only does what a systematic review does, but also takes the data, the hard data from all these different studies and puts them together to try to find any new information from that. So those are like the six types of reviews maybe you may be asked. The reason why I'm letting you know about these is I had a very bewildered nursing student come to me and say she was assigned to do a systematic review that was due in three weeks. Uh, you can't do a systematic review in three weeks. It's a very um, labor intensive, time intensive task. But I think her professor really meant for her to do was a scoping review or a state of art review. But she said, no, no, the professor said systematic review. So if a misunderstanding occurs, you could ask, you know, uh, exactly what kind of review you may be asked to be under, you, you may be asked to do. Okay, so we'll take just a quick little Lit Review Jeopardy break. Hello, Alex Trebek, and may he rest in peace. Um, so in the style of Jeopardy, I'll give you a statement, and then you come up with the question. What, what question does the statement answer? So uh, we're, all, we're all, you know, you're all college students. I imagine you like, uh, <laughs> you like, you like Jeopardy. Oh, quick question. Is a state of art review used in innovation and in science or grant proposals? Um, they, they can be, yes, um, because, because one of the things a state of art review will do is kind of talk about the current 
what's currently known in a particular area. And you could maybe use that information to go further, like say, okay, this is the current thing, but you're going to introduce something new that maybe addresses what those studies don't. So a state of the art review can be used usually in a science proposal. A lot of times, though, it might be like a um, general review, general uh, literature review too. Okay, so, okay, any more questions so far before we hit Alex? <laughs> okay. Okay, so the first lit review answer for $500. Original research, articles, patents, interviews, and creative works are considered this type of an information source. Go ahead and mention, go ahead and give the answer question, question answer in the chat. Go ahead and take a, take a shot at it. Original research, articles, patents, and creative works are considered this type of an information source. Okay, we got two primary sources. Connie says so. Okay, another one. Uh, Julianne says primary source and primary. Okay, and what are primary sources, Alex? If you'd like, you can write down that you earned 500 imaginary Jeopardy dollars for this question. <laughs> now for the second one. For $400, disciplinary norms, purpose, and rigor are some blank between types of literature reviews. So disciplinary norms, purpose, and rigor are some fill in the blank between types of lit reviews. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> I don't have any sound effects. <laughs> All right, the answer. What are differences? So literature reviews are different by their disciplinary norms, purpose, and rigor. Okay, so. Okay, so some of you may have racked up 900 imaginary Jeopardy dollars. We'll see. <laughs> So next we'll go into the seven steps of starting a literature review. And as I mentioned, the focus of this webinar will be the steps. Um, you can ask your advisor for the concept, like to help you define your concept, or you can go to like maybe the writing center to help with the writing if you need be, but I'm just gonna focus on the seven steps. And the first one would be to explore, select, and focus on a topic. This is gonna be the beginning of your question formation, research question, or hypothesis. If you don't know where to begin with that, just read some articles or publications on your concept and take a look at recommendations for further research or work in their conclusions. You can use this little exploration to help formulate your goal or objective for your review or to solidify it. And then for those of you who may be asked to do an actual systematic review or meta-analysis, here's where you determine your pre-established criteria or you identify what types of sources you're going to include in your review. So first you explore, select, and focus a topic. Second is where you prepare your search. Here's where you identify information sources for your topic and field. Of course, you can come to us, the FAU library, Maybe some organizations do a lot of research or work with your particular concept. I knew a photographer that looked at the Getty uh, because they needed to take a look at images a lot. And the Getty has a very big collection of images that we didn't really have. And that's an example of a special collection. But also consider other fields that also study your topic. Like for instance, one of the things that I find is that a lot of um, what's studied in social work and psychology overlap. Sometimes people in education may touch on some concepts in social work or psychology and so forth. So even if you're in your field, uh, think about other fields that might also be studying your concept. Familiar self, familiarize yourself with your organization's library and information services. We have interlibrary loan or document delivery that helps us get materials that you need that we borrow from other libraries for you. 
So definitely get to know the library, especially if you're um, going to be going into a doctoral dissertation or something like that. Another part of preparing your search is right before you hit the information search, whether it's through Google or a library uh, database, think about the keywords and the search strategy you're going to use. Think about the words you're gonna use in your search, the terminology. You could use synonyms in your keyword search too. So um, like for instance, I'm thinking uh, like cat, you know, cat is known as a feline, but then you got the species name for a cat, but then it depends on what kind of taxonomy you're using. So think about the, um, the types of words that you're gonna use in your search and then how you're going to combine them. And read reviews of your topic if they're made available to, for you too. It's not cheating. It's okay to read the other people's work and see how they did things too. The third step is when you start your search. And this is something I advise. I know that we're busy. We got a lot of things going on at once, but one of the things I found pretty consistently is it's always beneficial to keep track of your search strategies and results. And that way you're not backtracking or doing searches again, and you get to save your time doing that too. Skim, scan, read, or annotate what you find. I, whenever I do my literature reviews, I've got a highlighter or a pen on hand so I could write notes I have in the margins so I don't forget them. When you search, you could also take a look at chain or citation searching to find additional documents. What this means is you take an article or even a book and you take a look at their references, especially if the references cover a concept you're really interested in and wanna study further. This is known as pearl growing or pearl mining citation analysis or reference searching. So this is kind of like a very deep dive when you do the literature review. So that's known as chain or citation searching. Then kind of like what this lady is doing in the book stacks is known as manual or hand searching. Here's where you visit the stacks of your library and take a look at what's there. You may also go to your journal's online version and browse, flip, or skim through the publications on your concept too, because sometimes people will find some things that their search did not initially come up with. And here's something else I could advise too, search alerts. You can create a search alert by creating a personal account in a library database. For instance, we have one called JSTOR for the humanities people. And then there's another called Web of Science for the science people. And then we've got ProQuest for business. But if you set up a personal account on one of those databases, you could ask it to let you know whenever an article is published on your concept, it will email you an alert. You can say, email me every day with new information or email me every week or once a month. Uh, also, you could save your searches in these particular specialized information sources, so you don't have to, um, you know, read, you know, do your searches all over again. And then it could also tell you if a particular article is, um, like a new article, is out there on your particular concept. So definitely try the search alerts to help you find information. Fourth one. Now this depends on how how you like to organize your stuff. The fourth step is to organize your documents, data, and information. You've probably heard of EndNote and Mendeley or Zotero. Use citation management software. This is really helpful because it can help you store all the information that you find if you're looking through the library's information sources and databases. It can store your bibliographic records or information about your publications. You can share this information with other people too. And then EndNote and Mendeley have a plugin where when you use Word, Microsoft Word, or even Google um, Docs, if you open the EndNote or Mendeley plugin, it will actually import your citations into your paper and create a bibliography at the end. Now, those particular tools go beyond the scope of this literature review, but they're out there. Another part of organizing your documents and information is to identify file saving or sharing options. Like, are you gonna store your work in a Google Drive or Dropbox? Do you want it to be 
cloud-based? Are you going to store it on your PC or your laptop? Here's where you think about what you really, really need in terms of um, how to get to your information, if you need to share it, and so forth. So definitely find a way that you want to save your work and save your information. And then storing information, always have a plan or structure. Now you're going to collect a lot of documents. You may collect just journal articles. You may collect a variety of formats. And it's really important to create a filing system that makes sense to you and to others if necessary. I recommend establishing file naming conventions. Like here's an example of two actual files I have on my PC. As you can see, um, I've got a date. I got the format. Uh, what's it called? Literature review. And then the writer or who created that particular document. The second one was an article that I published with my colleague, Rebecca McCall. So if I ever want to find the article in my drive with just hundreds of documents, if I put in R. McCall or McCall, it should pull it up. So definitely find a way to organize your documents, data, and information. It will really, really help you save a lot of time and reduce your stress level. Another way that you could also organize is a literature review matrix. And it's like a grid, as you see here, where you put down the information about a particular source. Uh, one thing you could also add is a theoretical or conceptual framework, methodology, conclusions. Uh, but this could really help you with summarizing main points and finding associations between things you find. And then, of course, you can change the category depending on your particular needs or the norms of your discipline. The fifth step is to survey and review what's found. So here you'll identify some themes and concepts and highlight important papers. You'll also determine what's important or even what's out of scope or disputed. You'll take a look at the research premise design and the metho methodology utilized in your various studies. And then of course, it's important to review the described limitations of the study or recommendations for further research. Then you'll analyze and critique the literature. You can see where there are gaps, disagreements, and even anomalies. And then you can look at the relationships between the sources, like that little uh, mental image of the banyan tree I had. And you could use backward and forward reference searching to do that, or the chain mining, as I'd mentioned earlier. And then you could also think about how the various pieces can be integrated into a whole work. You can consider what literature is most relevant and appropriate to include in your review. So you'll find like, like over 100 articles, say, but you may only cite 40 of them or 50 of them, if that. But don't forget that the literature review is an iterative process. You may need to redo or revisit some parts of your search, find new or additional information, or even update your research question based on what you find. So if you ever have to do that, please don't get mad at yourself. Just say, well, I found new information. I had to make a little adjustment. The seventh and final step will be to provide a synthesis and overview of the literature. And this could be organized by themes or chronologically. So here's where you put all the different pieces that you found into one coher coherent picture or image that you want to present. OK, so the final Jeopardy question for $300. Formulating a topic, goal, or research question is a big part of this step out of seven. Which step? OK, that would be the very first step. Mm -hmm. Yep, just as F. Carr had said, it is going to be finding a starting a literature review. What is starting a literature review? All right, for $200. Using citation software and file naming conventions and having a plan for storing your information are known as, um, you could say a phrase or you could just say one word, it's okay. <laughs> so for $200, what is organizing, whether it's your files, information, or literature? So, okay, yep, or using EndNote, mm -hmm. use the EndNotes. Um, I had a question here. Was the spreadsheet a simple template 
the research can develop. Yes, um, you can definitely uh, use that use that spreadsheet. I used a, uh, <laughs> I used, that's what I used. I just used a regular Excel spreadsheet to make my uh, literature review matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're wrapping up. We got about 10 minutes left. Now, this is actually the fourth version of this presentation that I've done over the years. So I've added or refined my content uh, based on the questions and the feedback I got. One question I'm often asked is where can I start my search? Well, here at the FAU library, we have one search that will take a look at many different databases at once to look for the literature. And then we got very subject specific databases. So for the studio art person, we have art store. For um, the business person, we've got quite a few things for them. Um, I know that there's many, like, there's, I don't know if you do finance or human resources or, or something like that, but there's some specialized business and tax databases that we have. Web of Science is a big one for the scientists in the group. So we do have some databases that focus on just a particular discipline or even a specialty within it. Uh, we do have ProQuest theses and dissertations available through the FAU library. So you can take a look at other dissertations for samples. And like I said, it's always uh, it always makes your professor happy if you read his or her dissertation <laughs> and, and ask them questions about it. The library also has research guides, which are like pathfinders. The librarian basically curates some subject and topic specific information sources to give you a start to find your information. We do have a research guide in chemistry. We have quite a few in business and other subject areas and disciplines that you may be in. Google Scholar is not terrible either. I mean, it does actually collect a lot of um, information from organizations and other academic institutions. Google Scholar also has like a patent module too, and a lot of open access publications that don't necessarily need a subscription to read. And then the gray literature, which could be blogs or reports from an organization and, and things like that. And it also really, it would be up to you to try to find some other sources of specialized information for your subject or format. So for the for the chemist, you I don't know what kind of chemistry you practice, but patents might be something you're interested in. Um, special collections, that is, they're 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 um, basically libraries devoted to a particular type of material or subject or period of time and things like that. So you may want to find out like what specialized information sources may be out there for your particular format. And then finally, I always get this question and it doesn't hurt my feelings. I, I totally understand. And that's when can I stop? <laughs> when can you stop your lit review? I don't really have a square answer in terms of number of hours or how many publications you find. But I just have people consider the following. Think about whether or not your searches were done using standard information sources for your subject. Like for instance, PsycInfo is the go-to information source for uh, professional publications in psychology and SciFinder would be the one for chemistry. So what kind of searches did you do looking in those sources? Um, and then, of course, you can look in general library sources, too. You could also consider the amount of time spent on your search and the strategy used. If you really think and feel that you used all the different permutations of words and searches, um, you can consider that. The amount and quality of articles and evidence may be something, too. And then the repetition of results with various searches is another one. I've done some literature reviews and I'd use different kinds of words and keywords and come up with the same articles each and every time. And when that happened, I thought, oh, I think I found what I can find. And then when you're able to identify the seminal works and the more influential authors on a topic is a good, good way to um, consider when you could stop. And then of course, feedback to, to your search from your advisor and colleagues could be another one. Now, someone asked a question, is the limit of going back on lit reviews still 10 years? 
That really depends. I do know that the health sciences really likes to limit their literature review by years because they want the most current information. But then again, you got subjects like physics and the physical sciences where they will regularly quote books and articles and documents from like the 1940s, 50s or 60s because they were so well I guess something was was um, expressed and written about so elegantly that nobody could really found a way to do it quite as better. So I think how far back your literature review really has to do with your discipline, what your advisor suggests, and then how how much you feel like you need to have the background. You know how how far back do you really really need to go to feel like you have a comprehensive or complete understanding of your concept. So I'd say in terms of time limit, definitely ask your advisor and, and then follow their lead. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, but, um, but biographies or historical reviews, yeah, 10 years, yeah. Well, and plus history and those things, um, yeah, they, uh, they tend to stay fresh longer, so to speak too. So that's another thing. So those are the things that you can consider about whether to conclude your literature review. Now we do have books in the FAU libraries available on how to do the literature review in different subject areas. You can take a look at our catalog and check out those books. So if you need help or more information, you can contact or visit your campus library. You can go to the library service desk in person. So whether you're at the Jupiter or Har Jupiter campus, you can go there. And then ask a librarian a service where you can chat, text, or email your question. And if you feel like you need more help, you can request a research consultation from a librarian. So you could meet with a subject specialist in your area, and they can go over the library information sources available for you. Okay, and for those of you who want to take the quiz, it's available at this URL. You'll get your certificate for answering eight out of the 10 questions correctly, and the results will be sent within a few minutes. I just entered the URL into the chat so you could get that. If you have a mobile device that can read QR codes, you could also take a picture of this box and it will take you directly to it. Uh, don't worry, the quiz is not hard. I take a look at the results. It's never had a very bad failure rate. One person admitted to me, well, they came to me because they had a hard time getting their certificate, but I noticed they took it about eight times. And they told me they didn't even watch the webinar. <laughs> so that's why they did so badly. But usually the scores are in the 80s and up. So please don't worry. Uh, the URL is in the, oh, sorry about that. Let me, I thought I put that to everyone. It was, sorry about that. I just entered the bit.ly um, the bit.ly link in the chat so you could get to it. Okay, so I got just a couple minutes left. And as I said, the URL is in the chat if you need it. Um, okay, oops. So to give you a shameless plug on the library events, we have on Tuesday, February 22nd, um, copyright, fair use, and um, facts, myths, and basics webinar on Tuesday, Feb February 22nd. So if you want to learn more about copyright, what, what does it mean? What are your rights? And what is fair use? Uh, you can come to this webinar on the 22nd at 12 o'clock PM and then four o'clock PM. It's the same thing, just offered twice. And we're going to present on February 23, a documentary and discussion on, a, on copyright criminals. This is a documentary about hip hop music in the mid late 80s, and it interviews some of the hip hop artists at the time and talking about the fair use of other people's music and what it means. So definitely come to come to these events if you'd like to learn more about copyright and watch, watch a documentary on uh, hip hop and the legal aspects and creative aspects of it. Uh, I'm just gonna go blip back to the, to the, um, 
Okay, the uh, quiz for those of you who want that. So sorry about that. I, I have two different screens here and sometimes I'm paying too much attention to one as opposed to the other. All right, so this wraps up the literature review workshop. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you could ask in the chat. Uh, but otherwise, if you'd like to take the quiz, this is the URL and also the QR code that you could get to it. And I do apologize for uh, overlooking that, overlooking that information. But if you have any questions, you can contact me. My name is Christy Padron. I am the scholarly communications librarian based at the Boca Raton campus. I can answer your questions uh, by chat, text, or email and meet with you uh, virtually too. I put my email in the chat if you would like, would like to reach me. Also, if you're interested, I will send these slides out to everyone at the end of the webinar, and then you all will have a copy of that. So I don't see any questions here in the chat, but I would like to thank you for coming to the webinar and workshop today. Um, and thank you, Isabel and Mohammed, um, and thank you all for being here today. And if you have any questions or comments or concern, just, just let me know. All right, well, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Okay, and uh, uh, Valeria, um, yes, when you take the quiz, it will be self grading and it will give you your score very shortly after you take it. So don't, so you will get that. And then if you answered eight out of the 10 correctly, uh, it will send you the certificate of completion. You can take the quiz more than once too. So if you just so happen to not get the eight out of 10 you know, below that, you can take it again without penalty. All right, well, thanks everybody for being here today. Enjoy, do enjoy the rest of your day. All right, take care and goodbye.